Stanley himself had very good reasons for, for marrying Margaret Beaufort. Potentially, it put him in the position of being the stepfather to the King of England, which would be a position of enormous promise and potential wealth for him, as indeed it proved. What he did was he maintained his loyalty to Richard III. He swore right the way up to really the moment the battle lines were drawn that he would be joining Richard III on the battle, and he just held his forces back. He was a very, very calculating man. He was a very brilliant man, and he was a great survivor. He did indeed become stepfather to the King of England and died in his bed, which given that he had changed sides at least a couple of times throughout the war, it's a pretty impressive record. I think we always have to be really careful when we look at the reputation of women in history because a lot of history has been written by men who fundamentally don't like women very much. It's also written with quite a stereotype view of what women's nature is. So the queens who tend to be obedient and beautiful and biddable and fertile are the ones that history remembers as good queens and the ones who are powerful and determined and, and battle axes are the ones that get a lot of criticism. So everybody loves Jane Seymour because she married Henry VIII and, and gave him a baby. You know, nobody has the same affection for, say, Elizabeth Woodville, who was such a powerful force to be reckoned with, and Margaret Beaufort even more so. I think she suffers a bit from male prejudice. I think also to modern historians, one of the really important features of her was her learning, her scholarliness, and her spirituality, her holy life. And of course, we live in a secular society that doesn't prize those qualities. But a lot of people think that she was a very, very remarkable woman. Uh, you know, she studied French, Latin, and Greek on her own account, for her own choice. And I think she must have been a truly remarkable woman but probably not likable. I don't think she'd have been a very likable woman, and if you were her daughter-in-law, as my character, the White Princess, is Princess Elizabeth of York, I think you would have found her a very hard woman to live with. One of the challenges for me in writing a story about a woman who is absolutely driven by her sense of God, in writing her story for a very secular age, is how to explain to the modern reader that what we're talking about here is a genuine experience. And the easiest way for me to do it, and the way that seemed to work well for me in the novel, was to suggest that Margaret Beaufort, who reported in her life having a real sense of the presence of God, that as a little girl, she had visions. So I then started to wonder if Margaret Beaufort, as a little girl, had visions and a sense of holiness, what would that, you know, in a sense, how can we identify with that? And it made me think of Joan of Arc, you know, another little girl who had absolute visions that drove her to put a king on the throne of France, just as Margaret Beaufort ultimately put a king on the throne of England. Margaret Beaufort would have known about Joan of Arc because her reputation had reached England and indeed one of her guardians when she was a little girl had been responsible for the capture of Joan of Arc and had fought against her and he himself would tell other people that he had never faced a more formidable foe so in a sense though you had a connection where you knew there'd be an anecdote so this very impressionable little girl looking for a sense of destiny looking for an understanding of the working of God heard stories about a girl who clearly did have a sense of destiny who did understand the workings of God and who was successful in that. So it was, a very, it was a very good story for me to weave through and in a sense explained for us why Margaret Beaufort was so driven by her vision of what God should do for England through her son. One of the interesting things about Margaret Beaufort, and we do have records of it, is that she's a very substantial landowner and she runs her own estates in a very direct way. She has stewards, but she instructs them and we have some letters and we have some understanding of that. When she becomes, in a sense, all but Queen of England, I mean, she is, she's known as My Lady the King's Mother, which is an entirely new title which she, in a sense, takes on for herself. And she signs herself Margaret R which is Margaret Regina, so she's fundamentally calling herself queen. When she takes on this position, she then, I think, has a view of really running England in the same way. She certainly runs the court, so it is to her that we're indebted to a, a set of codified rules, how the court's to run, what they're to do on holy days, what is to happen when the queen goes into confinement to have a baby. All of these rules, how funerals are to work, how the weddings are to work, all of these rules are established by Margaret because she's not just powerful in the sense of she has 
as driving force and ambition in herself. She's powerful in that she likes to run things and she believes she has a vision as to how they should best be run. And the position that she gets to, because she gets her son on the throne of England, she gets herself into a position where she can run certainly all of the domestic side of the court of England and a great deal of her own land and properties herself.